Right, so uh, Labor says we need to increase our renewable energy production in order to keep the country powered in a green, sustainable way in order to combat climate change. Um, they've set the goal of producing 90% of our electricity from renewables by 2025, and they also cite a, a couple of achievements the last Labor government made, uh, including establishing the Marine Energy Development Fund and uh, several wave and tidal energy generation projects. So Labour also supports a strong emissions trading scheme which realises the true cost of carbon and incentivises investment in renewable energy research and development. Uh, again they promote home insulation schemes to make everything more efficient and again they note that their full energy policy will be released <laughs> next week. <laughs> um, and, and it's worth noting here because we won't really go into the health stuff but a lot of the parties have talked about home insulation as one of the uh, important measures for improving the health of the nation as well. Um, National says that they are serious about global warming and tackling climate change. Um, they are reducing costs for businesses while encouraging the transition to low carbon business. So they talk about having established the Global Research Alliance um, for which they provided 45 million for research aimed at tackling uh, greenhouse gas emissions and often agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there was the Green Growth Advisory Group to provide advice on how to achieve economic growth uh, sort of greenly. I guess one could say. And they also talk about the goal being 90% renewable energy by 2025 um, and talk about a key factor in this being the reform of the Resource Management Act to allow renewable projects to be consented far earlier than under the previous government. And they also talk about investing $18 million per year in renewable energy research, which is into areas such as geothermal, bio, solar, wave, and tidal energy. Uh, they also talk about having invested in insulation and clean heating uh, to reduce household energy consumption. They have been retrofitting or helping to provide money for houses to be retrofitted. And talk about uh, having recently introduced new energy efficiency standards, or, or say government did rather, for products and appliances which are expected to create net savings of $360 million for the country by 2020. So, Alf, your thoughts? Numbers. I like, I like numbers. numbers. I like are numbers good. too. I'm just not always sure I trust them in political context, but <laughs> yes. I don't trust the numbers in any context. That's why I like them. <laughs> That's true. The old 13% increase thing again. Yeah. Anyway, so... Look, renewables and sustainability is good. It's great. It's fantastic. Um, climate change is real. Climate change is happening. We need to do something about it. And moving to renewable energy sources is the most sensible way. Same for putting insulation in your house. It's just common sense to keep your family, the people that you love, healthy and to keep your electricity bills down. Mm. Um, and just... a, lot of the, a lot of the parties have, have come away and said that that is important. So it's nice. <laughs> I, absolutely. I, I completely agree. I'm, I'm always aware, particularly with things like energy, that there's a fair amount of possibly just saying what needs to be said, as there always will be before elections, I imagine, with pretty much any issue. So I'm not going to pick on this one particularly. I am going to pull out uh, as something that I found interesting, this mention of throwing a billion dollars at green tech, at clean tech, over the period of three years. Um, and... Uh, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about uh, that in one of the blog posts, and there's some interesting thoughts around that kind of number. But certainly, that that did make my eyes bug out a little bit because that's a that's a lovely amount of money to throw at something like that. Um, it is. Whether it's doable or not, well, <laughs> it's, it, it has a Doctor Evil sound to it. One billion, billion dollars. dollars, um, but exactly the opposite of Doctor Evil. His antithesis. It's sort of like Captain <laughs> Heroes, yeah, evil yeah. super plan. Um, I am glad to see, though, that the, the two sort of major parties are uh, sticking or saying that they want to stick with the goal of 90% renewable by 20, uh, 2025. I do find that enormously encouraging. Yeah, that is, that is really, really nice. Um, and, and other than that, not much to say other than, you know, fantastic. There's one other thing that I will caution, and that is throwing huge amounts of money at things you want to work in a science context does not always produce results. One can cite the huge investment into biotechnology sector yeah. over the past few decades. Mm. So I'm not saying that throwing money at it is a bad idea. Nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. I'm just saying with science, you have to be cautiously optimistic about your results. It depends how Nothing's one throws guaranteed. The, yeah, it depends how one throws the money at it and this is again this this debate about picking winners over providing 
incentives and cash and credits and basically letting, well, for want of a better word, the market come up with its own solutions as opposed to throwing yeah. money at specific problems or at specific technologies. That's a huge and ongoing debate yeah, uh, yeah. all over the Global world. Global scale, so. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, worth, worth, worth bearing in mind. Um, so I guess with that, uh, again, the other seven questions were, were absolutely fascinating uh, to see to see the responses. So please do go and have a look at the Science Media Centre website. We will link to that um, to go and see what everybody said. And, and you know, we hope that this may help you in the decisions that you will be making in the next 10 days or so. Uh, it's pretty important stuff. Um, and and it is interesting to note actually that um, science issues are some of the top issues even for, you know, sort of normal Kiwis for this election cycle. Water quality is apparently a major issue uh, and environmental issues in general. It could be also just because of disasters, uh, you know, like the Rena and everything like that happening relatively recently, so it's all very much top of mind for people. But with that, we'll go on and chat about a couple of the Cyblogs posts that were written around this. So, Alf, do you want to introduce them? I will indeed. So the first one, as we mentioned before, is written by Peter Griffin, who is from the Science Media Centre, so it's well written and well researched, and he just makes a few, uh, he, he pulls out a few of the, uh, the key issues that we've already mentioned, but he discusses them in more detail, which I won't do now. So he uh, weighs up each party, um, their policy around in environment versus economic growth so which policy which parties fall on either side of that which is really really nice to see and he cites some of the numbers that Amy just noted that might be one could call unrealistic um, and he explains why he feels that way which is which is really really nice and he go on, goes on to talk about the innovation push, noting the fact that everyone wants to push innovation because you have to be a cabbage if you don't. And then he <laughs> finishes up by talking about, he has a very interesting small segment on science leadership. I think now, we could go through that one, actually. Let's, yeah, what it's, did he it's say? Really, really, really interesting. So for those of you that don't know, the science and innovation minister, uh, minister Dr. Wayne Mapp, he's stepping down uh, after this election, even if natural, National does retain their power. And so a new minister needs to be around. As such, Waymap hasn't had a huge profile during this election, and He's, we're not sure yeah. who's going to come in and fill that gap. Yeah, there's there's no really strong contender on that one. I mean, we've we've got a strong science spokesperson in the form of Professor Sir Peter Gluckman, which we're very lucky to have. He does Absol a fantastic job. Absolutely, but in terms of strong sort of government specific science voices, we don't seem to have much. Though it's interesting, um, Peter does note that in many situations it has actually been John Key himself which has stepped him to address the big mm. science issues, yeah. which is nice. Well, it shows how important science issues are if you know our, our PM is directly addressing them. But So yes, uh, Peter then also talks about um, uh, David Shearer, who's Labour science spokesperson, and also points out that he's been pretty low key on this area of policy. Although there's this policy coming out next week, so it'll be interesting to see what that says. And one one might imagine that he may be vocal at that point. Um, and then the <laughs> one would hope that he sings like a little bird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course, for the Greens, uh, science and environment policy is is so integral to their values that. Um, one is not surprised that Russell Norman has been very active in this area, particularly around uh, green growth and clean tech. So, yeah, Peter's, Peter's written a, a really, really fascinating analysis, pulling in some of the other information that's available out there around, um, you know, R&D and innovation and, and clean tech. And, and, and one of the big questions, you know, of course, environment on one hand versus economic growth on the other. And how do we balance them? <laughs> Do they need to be balanced? What's going on there? Mm. Uh, each of the parties has a slightly different take on, yeah. on that, uh, and it's pretty easy to pick out. Uh, right. Uh, the other one is is a bit more focused. This is from Alison Campbell, of whom we spoke. She writes Bioblog, and Alison is very much an educator, so she talks about the education question, the science and education question, very specifically, and talks about where she agrees and disagrees with what the parties have said. Alf, uh, you're more involved with education than I am. Do you want to take us through some of it? Firstly, I'd just like to say that Alison's response to some of these is, is absolutely bang on it's and brilliant. hilarious. Um, she, the ACT's response does not particularly sit well with her, um, particularly they note, uh, she notes 
that uh, they want a more decentralized system and she cites several examples where a decentralized system doesn't particularly work and she this as she to, quoting her directly this leads her to wonder if the party's spokesman had actually looked at the New Zealand science curriculum and about their attitude towards a nationally agreed standard um, which I think sums it up pretty well mm. And also talking about uh, the idea of, of this with this decentralized system and talking about um, the Calgary Science School, for example, in Alberta, uh, and, and how decentralized systems might you know, foster things. In addition to her New Zealand science curriculum points, she says one wonders why they didn't also cite the decentralized system of the US, where science teaching is distinctly uneven in quality and where scientists and science teachers are constantly fighting efforts to have creationism taught in the science classroom. Uh, so she's not of the belief that this very decentralized model is a particularly good one mm. for New Zealand. Um, so not not chuffed. Elf, what's next? What did she So comment on? next she commented on the uh, the Greens policy, and as an ex secondary school teacher, she's quite uh, she's you know, she's well equipped to actually talk about it. And she notes how crucial it is. The best teachers are those that get the time and the funding to go out and do their own research and interact with their own researchers. She thinks that this is absolutely critical. And from personal experience, I can say that this is this is absolutely it's correct. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, the, the teachers that I've met doing uh, sabbaticals and doing fellowships up at Victoria University are heads and shoulders above their competition and you can see it in the school kids that come to first year physics at Vic. Mm. It's, it's, it's clear as day yeah. uh, the difference that that can make. So it's, uh, she's well impressed. In agreed. That. Although she does point out the, the unfortunate practicality of the situation, which is cost. Um, how, how, do, how do we pay for this? Um, and she leaves the question open, but it's again uh, that that budget would bear some careful scrutiny. What's next, Amy? Uh, from Labour, uh, Labour talked about uh, reinstating postdoctoral fellowships um, and the scheme for better funding for brilliant scientists, where basically they would give portable money to scientists and let them go and set up shop where they chose, at which institutions, recruit people from wherever they needed even if overseas, and sort of do their thing. Um, well, she, she notes that there's not much on the wider area of education apart from the comments on the postdoc scholarships. And, and she comes back to wanting to know more about their take on actually encouraging young people to study science in the first place, um, as well as, of course, reinstatement of scholarships for top doc students. That seems to be taken as read in many science circles. Um, and... She, well, she basically found it a little bit of a disappointing answer and does state very clearly that she is not anti-Labour generally, so it's not, you know, her being biased. Mm. Well, except as a science educator. 